Virtual memory is a term banded around that everyone expects you to know. The best definition I've seen, which is still absolutely awful, is on Wikipedia. It says, In computing, virtual memory, or virtual storage, is a memory management technique that provides an idealised abstraction of the storage resources that are actually available on a given machine, which creates the illusion to users of a very large main memory. And I know what you're thinking. What the fuck does idealised abstraction mean? I also take issue with creates the illusion of very large main memory because that's not what virtual memory is fundamentally for. I'm calling out the authors on the book for that cock up. Historically, a computer was a person that performed a bunch of calculations. If you ever get the chance to watch hidden figures, you'll see how NASA used people to crunch data for their space programme. In fact, people didn't even think of computers as machines until Charles Babbage, Ida Lovelace, Alonzo Church and Alan Turing suggested it. And I know what you're thinking. What does any of this have to do with virtual memory? Essentially, all computers are the same thing. A processor that reads some memory and performs many actions. The list of actions a computer must perform is called a program. It's a bit like a human being reading a calculation sheet with a bunch of formulas on it and actually performing the calculations. But how do these programs or list of procedures originally written on paper make it into the machine's memory? Originally, machines or computing machines used punch cards to load this data into their own memory. And a punch card is just a sheet of paper that had specific holes punched out of it in particular locations. A hole in a particular location would represent some sort of value. Now that value didn't really mean anything unless you had some lookup table to say what the actual number meant. And this is what is meant by an instruction set architecture. The machine could read that punch card and would understand what it means. And the idea was this. These punch cards would be read one after the other and placed into some location in the machine's memory. After loading all the punch cards in memory, the processor would then jump to the beginning of the program and start running. And then hopefully the program would finish and print some sort of answer. Later editions of computers introduced teletype machines, or TTY for short. The introduction of teletype machines means that punch cards were no longer required to be able to enter instructions and commands into the computer. In fact, this is where TTY shells on things like Linux and Unix get the name from. It's far easier to type instructions on an original keyboard than creating many punch cards which you can make mistakes on. However, after a short period, computer scientists faced a problem. How do we make it easier to load many programs into memory at once across different memory devices? The issue was that programs have to load at precise locations, such as the start of the memory itself, or at places such as hex 1000. And all of these addresses were hard coded and cannot be changed. If you had two developers around the world writing a program for a particular type of computing machine, then there's a risk of some address collision because the programs need to be loaded and run over one another. Additionally, new machines were using multiple new memory banks for additional storage. And it was very cumbersome when programming to have to read and write from different locations all over the place. The solution to both of these problems came in the form of memory address translation. The idea is to build a table of address locations in the computer's machine memory and then change the address. The thing that changes the address or the table is called a memory management unit. Now, instead of requesting a specific area of memory, the computing machine instead finds some unused area of the physical memory and returns the address. But the physical address returned is not the same one that is presented or was requested by the original program. The MMU records the physical address that it was given on the right and then gives out a pretend address on the left that is used by the program running. 
this pretend memory on the left hand side is called virtual memory because it physically doesn't exist. It takes a fake address and maps it to a real one and that's the job of the MMU in the middle. There is just a bunch of fake addresses on the left, also called virtual addresses, and physical locations on the right. The physical locations are where programs are physically stored or data is physically stored. And the ones on the left is what the actual process or program thinks it has. Unfortunately, all good deeds do not go unpunished and virtual memory couldn't escape the wrath of a great idea. It turns out that requesting precise memory locations and memory blocks is unbelievably inefficient. Imagine if a processor only ever asks for one byte of memory at a time from the computing machine. The memory table would need three things at a minimum. The physical memory address, the mapped virtual address, and the size requested. One byte of memory could end up taking 20 bytes per table entry in the address translation table. The MMU table also has to exist somewhere in memory. Therefore, this translation table would waste more space than the program even required. To solve this, scientists decided to break the memory down into specific chunks. For example, 496 bytes. Now, the computing machine instead provides large contiguous blocks of memory whenever memory is requested. It has a couple of benefits. First, the memory table is much smaller because there is no longer a size parameter that needs to be included per table entry. And because smaller blocks can't be requested, it's not going to use up a lot of memory overall. Second, it's much easier to request these blocks because they're all of the same or similar size. The computing machine knows and can place and more efficiently store data in RAM and cause fewer fragmentations when doing so. This process of breaking memory into physical chunks and providing these chunks to the program is called memory paging. And each one of these chunks is called a memory page. A common confusion in the computing industry is that paging means paging to disk. They are not the same. Paging breaks down physical memory into precisely sized chunks and gives those chunks to the underlying operating system as virtual addresses or virtual address space. It has nothing to do with touching the disk. However, paging to disk does exist and it is a clever idea developed by computer scientists to save space while your machine runs. It's common for memory pages never to get used or see little utilization while a program is running. For example, a database program could load tens of thousands of table entries into memory, but only ever touch the first 100 rows. Everything else would just sit there and never get touched. But operating systems are pretty good at tracking page performance. Any time it detects a memory chunk or page that is not being used, it writes that page to a physical store on disk. On Windows, the page file lives on the C drive, although it's hidden. I will show you an example on the screen. You're probably wondering what happens if your program needs to use one of the rows. After all, it's possible you page one of these pages to disk and then thereafter you use the page. Well, there's a simple answer. Your operating system reads the page file on the disk and then reads the relevant page, then loads it into a free memory slot in your RAM. Your computer constantly performs these actions by protecting unused pages, placing them into the page file on disk, and then loading them back into memory as required. The process is called paging to disk because it's only possible to do because of memory paging existing in the first place. Now for some quick terminology and tips. If a page is currently in active memory, it is said to be resident in memory. If a page is missing and your program tries to access it, it will generate a page fault. 
The memory pages currently resident in memory are said to be part of the working set. Swapping is a different term to paging on disk. Paging to disk is the access and process of writing memory pages to the physical disk, whereas swapping is your computer unloading a page from memory to the disk to make room for another one on the disk. It is also called thrashing and probably means your computer is about to fall over. If you have a sensitive piece of data, such as a password in memory, it is entirely possible for that memory page to get written to disk. However, programmers have an option to prevent pages from ever being written to disk that they specify when allocating memory. And finally, malware developers are also aware of this flaw. And what they do is they also mark their own malware and tools to prevent it being written to the page file because it makes it much more difficult for antivirus products to detect it and means it's more difficult for a post-mortem analysis to be performed.